Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Sleep Matters podcast from Dreams. Everything you need to know about how to get a good night's sleep and why it matters so much. I'm Dr. Pixie McKenna, and today's episode is going to deal with sleep paralysis. I'm really pleased that I am joined by Hope Bastine, and Hope is one of London's leading sleep psychologists. And I also have Jessica Barrett, and Jessica is a journalist but also suffers from sleep paralysis. So let's kick it off with what sleep paralysis is. Oh, <laughs> um, it is a, um, a, a sleep disorder where there is a mismatch in alignment with you, your conscious mind waking up and your uh, dreaming state. There, there's an overlap. Okay. Um, and it's associated with um, a great deal of fear and anxiety, um, which I'm sure you can relate to. <laughs> Is that, I mean, tell me about your experience with, with sleep paralysis. Um, so I've suffered with it about 21 years since I was 15. Um, and it really doesn't get any less scary. Every time you have it, you just have this sensation that um, something terrible is about to happen. You can't move, you can't scream, um, you can't open your eyes, um, and you're just sort of basically locked in your body for what feels like quite a long time, but actually is only really a matter of a few seconds. Mm. And how frequently would that happen to you? Um, it started off sort of happening quite irregularly and then as the years went on um I would say probably about two years ago it started happening multiple times per week and then multiple times per night within that week as well um but it, I did notice that it was very related to what was going on in my life so if I was anxious stressed um obviously I wasn't sleeping probably properly anyway and then I would notice that it would start happening more and why what's going on so why why is she feeling parallel what, what's happening Okay, so during the dreaming state, um, your occipital lobe lights up, which is the visual center of the brain, and that enables you to dream and enables you to visualize and process the day and act things out. Um, sorry, not act things out, <laughs> mentally act things out. Yeah. Um, but the hormones, the melatonin causes a paralysis in the body to stop you acting out your dreams. Um, and um, following REM, which is the dreaming state, we all wake up for a few minutes. And as the night progresses, each time we wake up for a little bit longer. So with somebody that suffers from sleep paralysis, there's just a little bit of a misalignment going on there. Okay. So um, most people report like trying to call out, but their voice box isn't working. And that causes a great deal of fear because obviously you you, 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 you start to create illusions but it's only because your dreaming brain is still sort of spilling over into your conscious mind so it's difficult for you to interpret the information that you begin to experience when your conscious mind is waking up so i guess my experience of this is waking up and there's a guy in the room <laughs> yeah. and and being and going <laughs> you know, or not knowing where I am and perceiving that there's someone there that shouldn't be there. Yeah. So um, it's commonly reported that there's this sense of a presence. Um, so there's this other sense going on. Sometimes we call it our gut instinct, but there's a part that there are other senses beyond the five senses. Um, and uh, during our uh, non-conscious states we're actually more honed into that so whilst we're waking up our hearing sense is probably the first one to come back on and that is the one that tells us that there's something in the room or there are sounds but your conscious mind is not quite able to interpret the information correctly then you start to see maybe shadows or 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 um, even through your eyelids you can still interpret whether or not there is light or dark and things like that so you um you you misinterpret the information that's around you. But it is the most common symptom that people report, the sense of presence. Do you have that? Do you have the sense of presence? Or are you that, just so terrified yeah. you can't think of anything? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's pretty scary on its own without that. I don't tend to get that sort of... I mean, because I've obviously read a lot about it um, over the last couple of decades, and I don't tend to get that demonic presence that people report. 
but it did happen to me once and like once was enough I had this I mean this is really dark but I was I fell asleep on the sofa and then I was obviously overtaken by sleep paralysis and in my mind I was awake like I could see my my house in front of me and mm. there was an old woman who was dragging herself across the floor towards me and was going to kill me oh and that God. was um and I would, couldn't move and I couldn't wake up and I couldn't wow. do anything but that was the only time I've ever had thankfully the only time I've ever had that sort of dark presence or like that sense of threat really unless it's incorporated itself into a nightmare where something bad is happening to me yeah. within the nightmare yeah but in the room I don't get that presence apart from that one time which is like Don't something out of a, a horror film <laughs> yeah and would you so for example last night did you have any um sleep paralysis no well I'm I'm sort of currently really working hard to sort of keep my routines in order and do all the things that I've been told not to do to not have sleep paralysis so I actually haven't had it for six months now which is huge progress for me having wow. struggled for so long um so no I didn't have it last night and I actually haven't had it for quite a long time now which is quite good <laughs> so the, the the key symptoms that um Jessica may have or other people may have what what are they I mean because I suppose this is something that certainly when you were 15 I mean you probably didn't have a clue what was going on I mean I, nobody I, spoke about no, it no the, the, the first it. time it ever happened I had no idea what was going on I thought I was in a coma I yeah. thought I was paralyzed like genuinely paralyzed I didn't have any idea and when I spoke to my mum she sort of knew what it was but she'd never had it and you know it was I didn't have the internet so it was quite a sort of isolating feeling I suppose mm -hmm. to not I didn't know anyone else that had ever experienced it and I suppose as a teenager people are probably going yeah right well, well. You, do you know what I mean <laughs> or Here's probably thought that thing. I was just really drunk or something <laughs> <laughs> weird yeah so what are, what would you know if someone's listening to this and they think yeah weird stuff happens to me and I wake mm. up and I don't quite know what what were the sort of key symptoms that maybe you're you would have experienced through your own so I think first of all it's actually quite common to see this with children because children are still processing and they're still their their brain is still being developed their circadian rhythm alignment and all these different things are still happening so it's actually quite common to be seeing this with children and it happens a lot with nightmares um sleep paralysis is very much connected to nightmares and it can and it sort of almost feel like your 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 nightmare is spilling out into your, your daymare. <laughs> yeah. Um, a lot of people report shortness of breath. Mm -hmm. And this is actually a paradox of what's going on with the sleep process because whilst you're sleeping, your breath rate and your heart rate is much lower anyway. So when you're waking up before you're supposed to be waking up, you will already be having a a lower breath rate than you would if you were awake. So that's the first thing that people experience. Then you start hyperventilating, trying to breathe more, but uh, your body's still not quite ready to do that. Still, there's still uh, the paralysis hormones going through. That creates a sense of panic because you're not able to do something that, that you want to do. Um, and of course, we all associate breathing with living and death. Yeah. So a lot of people freak out and believe that they're going to die or there's there's a predator they're going to so it's shortness of breath uh, a presence or some kind of predatory experience because that's weird because you're freaking out but you can't freak out because yeah. you can't nothing works <laughs> that's right yeah oh, um gosh. so it's i mean uh, the other thing is that our attention um, of our body is very much focused up here um, and we lose um awareness sometimes of our extremities but actually one way to get yourself out of it is to start paying attention to your extremities um, because the the hormones are, are are less prominent there when you start to wake up so I like to tell people to do a, a kill bill which is wiggle your big toe <laughs> mm, I was told to wiggle my start wiggling my little finger and then try and wiggle the rest of my fingers which was something I started trying to do to kind of get back in touch with my body yeah. even though I felt so out of yeah. control and not in touch with my body and that has kind of helped me focus instead of panicking yeah which panicking just makes it worse yeah so you have to sort of tell yourself yeah I know that I can handle this and I've done this before yeah. and nothing bad is going to happen to me and that was starting with focusing on my fingers was one of the yeah. things that really helped I also recommend that people sort of try to clench their fists and release their fists. So, because uh, not only are you uh, increasing the blood flow to your hands, it also gives you something to, to focus and concentrate on, but also cleansing our, our fists help us to 
sort of prepare for something. You know, if you feel the fear, you, your automatic reaction is to want to fight back. And uh, we sometimes we're can... Ready. Yeah. We're ready for that. We're ready to do that. But also that causes the adrenaline release, so that counteracts yeah. the, um, the, the somnolent feeling that's going on. So a, a melatonin and adrenaline do not operate in the same space. Now, so when you're bringing adrenaline into... This, uh, into the picture, um, the melatonin and the sleep issues are going to start fading away. So you're going to start to wake up. In terms of the hallucinations, so we've got the guy in the room. What else? What else have we? Would you be familiar with? Um, it's um, it might explain the alien ad- abduction scenario. Okay. <laughs> going to sleep uh, well tonight. <laughs> that, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, but also apparitions, ghosts. Um, remembering also that whilst we're dreaming we're processing our life experience we're processing our learning and perhaps um, sleep paralysis is associated with with trauma and anxiety Um, so you might actually be processing a grief for example and then think that you're seeing the loved one in 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 the room Uh, okay so it might it might explain ghosts (laughs) demystified ghosts are there any Auditory hallucinations. So do people hear stuff? Yeah. Um, so uh, when you're sleeping, your uh, yeah, sense of hearing is the last to go and the first to switch on. And this is associated with our evolutionary survival brain. Um, and when you are in a state of anxiety or a heightened state of stress, your, your senses sharpen and hone in. So you hear things really, really acutely. But because your uh, your um, prefrontal cortex is still beginning to switch on, your interpretation of information um, may not be um, aligned with reality. So you you know you hear uh, some rustling or something like that, and you'll interpret that as somebody's in the room. Because you're in a state of vulnerability, um, you you are automatically interpreting anything else that's um, around you as threatening. And that's okay. that. That's your evolutionary survival brain sort of kicking yeah. in. Do you think that that was why I mostly got it when I, it was because I was on my back, and that was because like subconsciously I felt more vulnerable because you you're not like so protected when you're sleeping on your back. Um, pos- quite possibly. I'm I'm the other way around. So if I'm sleeping face down, my back is exposed and I can't oh, see. Oh yeah, what's but going I always on. sleep on my side, so I oh, feel like my okay. brain would like. I don't know, maybe that would kick in if yeah. I was on my back because I didn't yeah. feel like protected or like yeah, you're, in, you're, you're in, my, exposed, in the fetal you're position. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So if we're around at Jessica's house and she's on the sofa or somewhere and she's crashed out yeah. and we think she's having an episode, yeah. should we wake her up? Um, yeah, you, you, you do need to, you do need to wake up. Yes, right. please. <laughs> <laughs> That's all you're desperate for. You want someone to come yeah. and like grab yeah. you so you yeah, can snap you out of it. So, I mean, if, if loved ones are around, so I, I tell people to lean into love. So love is the unconditional aspect of our lives, the compassion, and that really is soothing for us. So if you have a loved one around, um, ask them to, you know, calmly, stroke you, whisper endearments, something that will calm you and relax you. So actually that uh, intervention is very, very powerful. But can I, you know, I'm there, I'm having, I don't know, the man's in the room. I, I don't, uh, am I, am I going to be able to go, am, am I going to be, give any, be able to give any signal to somebody else that? Um, so if, you, if you're in the room with a loved one, they will see it as you having a nightmare. Okay. So, um, and of course, when we see people in distress we want to go and comfort yeah. them so yeah it's it's a good thing to do the paradox of, of um a lot of people ask me how do I wake up from this the paradox is that you are actually awake awake yeah it's um, creepy I don't like this <laughs> at all actually <laughs> but what, what's what's interesting is that um the uh the sort of sleep polaris overlap is only lasts for about one to two minutes, but it feels like it's forever. That's quite a long time, though, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, <laughs> it's happening. Yes, it is. Um, <laughs> An old lady crawling across the floor. I'm about to kill you for one or two minutes. For two minutes. <laughs> <laughs> but if you, uh, you know, have a plan and you're with a partner and and you have a plan together, if you do little interventions like wiggling your toe, uh, clenching your fist, bringing your attention actually to your eyelids, so uh, attention, energy flows where attention goes. So if you are unable to open your eyes and see what's going on 
to, to protect yourself. If you bring your attention to your eyelids, that will be you're directing the energy for that to start moving for you. So, mm-hmm. you know, and also <laughs> the best tip is to uh, focus on your breathing and just go slow and relax. And within 60 seconds, it will start to get yourself out of it. Because I feel like when this has happened to me, I, I I just don't know if I'd be able to, I suppose I've never thought of trying to get myself out of it. I've just thought of wait for the moment to pass and I'll just wake up. Mm. I don't know if I'd be able to make myself do something. Um, I feel like I'm just very vulnerable and I'm there. Yeah, and yeah I, I, I understand. But if you sort of make the plan the night before... Um, and it's the last thing that's on your mind in terms of here's my my mechanisms, here's my intervention. God, I wouldn't see a wink. <laughs> <laughs> but if you have if you have a plan and an answer, yeah. that usually relaxes people. Mm. Um, and if it's by the bedside table, it's the last thing that uh, you've thought about. So it's quite likely that it'll be the first thing that you think about when, when you, you wake up. Okay. And when you have it quite regularly, you have to have that plan ready in your head because. Yeah you're not in that sort of initial stage of just blind panic which I was early on and even sort of until about five years ago I suppose after that I was like I I have to do something I can't just lie there panicking and trying to scream I have to take control of this and that was why I sort of started trying to have these sort of plans and things that I would do and just trying to pretend to myself that I was going to go back to sleep anyway and rather than trying to fight it and things like that just seeing if I could play around with it almost a bit like lucid dreaming, I suppose, Mm, because you're not fully awake. So you're kind of having a conversation with your subconscious, which is strange. So where did you go? Because it's a terrifying... I mean, I can't imagine what it must have been like for you going to bed every night, anticipating this was going to happen. Where did you go for help? What what did you... Was it your own research? Was it... Well, I started doing my own research when it got really bad. I was struggling with um, uh, grief at the time when it got particularly bad and I thought well I do need help with this now and so I started thinking well I'm I'm going to write something because I, d- I couldn't really find much that was written about it yeah um, that wasn't in sort of um, like medical um, uh, magazines and things like that or like you know on, on medical websites and things like that and I couldn't find anything that was sort of a first person piece mm-hmm. so I, I, I started trying to find experts or doctors that I could speak with um, so I went to a doctor on Harley Street and filled out all these forms and we had a really long conversation and, and he said, well, look, we're going to have to take you into a hospital for like two or three days, hook you up to all these machines. You won't be allowed to sleep for more than 20 minutes at a time when we monitor all of this. Um, and it's going to cost you £3,000 mm-hmm. and then mm-hmm. I'm going to put you on Prozac. Oh dear, and so right. I thought okay. to myself, no, that's not what I want to do. Yeah. <laughs> so I started speaking to a lot of experts and um, figuring out where I was going wrong with my routines, um, mm-hmm. what I should be doing before bed, the sleep patterns that I should be getting into. I had to say goodbye to having lots of late nights and going out because alcohol is a really big trigger Um, and um, looking at my phone before bed I think those kinds of things did really exacerbate it. So tackling this actually is a bit like tackling most of the sleep problems although this is effectively a parasomnia so slightly different to um, some other issues that people have it's looking at what you're doing during the day yeah because ultimately that's going to impact what kind of a night you have. Yeah, our sleep life is impacted by our day life. Um, and it's a cyclical experience. Um, sometimes the stresses of the day will bleed into the night. But all equally, a bad night's sleep will cause us to be more stressed during the day. Stress, anxiety, uh, any kind of substances, alcohol, caffeine, drugs, medication. Never thought of that, actually. Um, all impact our sleep yeah. more so because it causes a, a misalignment in our sleep cycles and our circadian rhythm. And for specifically for somebody who's suffering from sleep paralysis, they are suffering from a misalignment in the sleep cycles. So for someone who's listening and, and reports to similar things to Jessica where it's happening really, really frequently, you, you, you need to get help. You need to not say, yeah. hey, I'm a bit quirky. This happens if you think I'm yeah. acting oddly. You, you actually need to get help. Yeah, um, it's it's important to get some support. It might be, you know, that you're processing a grief, a loss, some trauma. It's very, very common with people who suffer from uh, anxiety and PTSD. 
Um, this happens quite a lot. And it can pass. You know, it, there is also evidence that it is genetic, but our behaviors can modify our genetic expression. We know that. Um, so really, really being precious about your pre-sleep ritual, making sure the more relaxed you are before you go to sleep, the better your sleep quality is going to be. I'm yeah. sure you've discovered that. Well, yeah, it's now my routine is, like, you know, I'll go upstairs about an hour before I'm going to go to sleep. And instead of, I used to always watch stuff on my laptop. And mm. that's probably one of the worst things you yeah. can do because, then I started sort of processing all those things and they would become part of my dreams or my nightmares and yeah. my sleep. I was sort of really drifting in and out of sleep after that rather than if I read or listen to an audiobook. Yeah. I find that I go into a much deeper sleep and it's definitely I feel a lot more rested than yeah. if I've been watching things. And I had never thought of that and I don't know why. But definitely listening to podcasts and audiobooks with yeah. the lights out is something that has absolutely yeah. changed my life because I'm not exposing myself to all these kind of lights and, you know, stories yeah, and yeah. like, you know, on, on the screen, which I think was really disrupting my sleep. Did you find that writing a journal helped before bed? I haven't actually tried that. And also I've never written down my dreams or anything like that, which I feel like I should have done. Um, well, yeah, ex if it ever happens again, yeah. try that. Um, it really does work because journaling is a way of paying attention to the information that we're trying to process mm. subconsciously and it helps us to process the, that information. So it might actually help to mitigate against the nightmares or the parasomnias. That's really interesting. I will try that. Um, what kind of person, what's the sort of typical person that has sleep paralysis? How, how common is it, first of all? I suppose we don't know, do we? Um, we, don't, we don't have a lot of research on this. This is still a very new area of research. Um, there, we do know that there is a genetic connection. We know that there is a connection with people who are having a sh shift work, who are suffering from anxiety and PTSD. Um, and uh, people who maybe have some kind of substance issue as so, well. Uh, but substance could be anything from Yeah, it alcohol can be alcohol, tea, caffeine. Caffeine. Yeah. And so if you have sleep paralysis and it's something you've lived with and, and you know, it bothers you but it doesn't bother you, what's the, what, what's the danger for you? Is there a danger for you? I mean, is it more dangerous than having crazy dreams? Is it more dangerous than... What, where is it on the scale of... I think the, da the, the main danger for me is that it disrupts your sleep. Mm -hmm. And we now know that, you know, poor sleep quality will kill us eventually. Um, so th there's that factor. Um, the other danger is that um, you're still struggling to process maybe a trauma. Okay. And that is going to impact your waking hours as well. Yeah. So um, unless you've dealt with the thing that's... Yeah. Mm. Um, and then in extreme cases, and I did have a client that was on, you know, six red bulls a day. So that contributed to the problem. But he uh, used to live in a flat um, very high up and he would try escaping. He was he mm. felt trapped and he would. So, you know, the, the body starts to physically moving, but you're still in that dreaming state. Right. Mm. So people do run out of the house, climb out of windows and so it, it can be it's physically mad, dangerous. Yeah, I, I've often found myself in different parts of my house or my husband will be like, where are you going? And I will sleepwalk or be talking rubbish and scary for him because he doesn't know how, what to do or what whether mm. to wake me up or what I'm going to do. Um, and, you know, I've never tried to go out of the front door, but he has found me like in a completely kind of manic state, really. But mm. I'm completely asleep. So, is, so were you a sleepwalker? Uh, but is that is that something that you've been yeah uh, and um it, it it's not normally sort of i'm not normally com just wandering around the house but i will get up and try and go somewhere i don't know if this is what people like other people do but i'll get yeah. up and like, get my handbag or i'm searching yeah. for something yeah. or something like that yeah. um and it doesn't normally last that long but also if, for somebody that's in the room with you it's quite troubling so mm. are we maybe are there people who are put down as sleepwalkers are they maybe sleep paralysis people who are ultimately they, they do overlap yeah yeah so you will see both um how interesting <laughs> gosh so the, the i guess so the overriding message is what you're doing by day can affect this yeah 
Um, and I think also we, we should be, because we're, we're looking to try to fix the kink and the misalignment in your, your, um, your sleep cycle. So nutrition also plays a key role in that. So making sure that you have plenty of magnesium, um, that you're producing the appropriate amounts of melatonin, that you're mitigating against any kind of stresses in your life. So that How do we know if we're producing the appropriate amounts of melatonin? Um, well, that you start to feel sleepy within an hour yeah. of, of darkness okay. or, or low light <laughs> and that um, you're not waking up periodically throughout the night. So stress interacts with uh, and, and disrupts the, the sleep process. So somebody who's had quite a lot of stress during the day may be exhausted and fall asleep for a little while, but will be waking up every so often throughout the night and struggling to get back to sleep. Okay. So magnesium also is not only an effective muscle relaxant, but it also is extremely important for neuronal function and helps to con break down and metabolize and create the production of, of melatonin. So right, nutrition so is key. And when would you take that? When would you take in the, the magnesium evening. in the evening? Part? In the before evening. You, like half an hour before you go to bed? Or? Um, probably about an hour. So yeah. you can have it with your main meal. The problem with magnesium when you're using it as an inter uh, intervention for uh, sleep is that it's an extremely effective muscle relaxant. So if you uh, take it all, um, if you ingest all of it, you're going to have <laughs> very, very loose bouts. Not helpful when you're yeah, trying yeah. to get to sleep. Okay. So I suggest that people take, split it, split the dose up, have some topically and some ingested. Right, so go in the bath with it. Go in the bath with it, have, have yeah. a nice bath, hot bath soak. Um, or you can get gels and sprays. Um, it does make your skin sensitive, so don't overdo it on, on that as well. So, Gosh, yeah. have you used magnesium? I started using magnesium flakes, but I don't know if that would be yeah. like yeah. effective enough. But I was having baths with magnesium flakes, which I found really helpful. Right. I mean, it's it's amazing. It's yeah. my favorite. My favorite. Mm. <laughs> yeah. So we have to get good at what we're doing during the day, and then I think the message from you is really probably to inform if we've got someone in the bed next to us. Yeah. To um, inform them to help us. Yeah. Um, Depends if they're a heavy sleeper or not, though, because my husband would mm. never wake up yeah. <laughs> if I was um, making any kind of signal. But I think the main takeaway f that I have learned is that you can't expect to do whatever you want during the day and it not be reflected in your sleep. Yeah, you absolutely. can't be yeah. super stressed, super busy, not look after yourself, um, you know, go out um, a lot and, you know, um, live your life on sort of turbo charge and then expect to not have, you know, expect to have completely restful sleep. It's just not going to happen. And I learned to completely kind of reprogram my routine and, and take things more sort of to take my sleep more seriously. And that's how I've managed to kind of control my sleep paralysis. And do you wake up feeling refreshed in the morning? I do, yeah, yeah. Um, I do. I, and I'm, I'm not having quite so many nightmares and um, I certainly have managed to escape sleep paralysis for now. Although sometimes, I'm um, saying this to Hope, I have nightmares that I'm having sleep paralysis even if I'm not okay. having <laughs> So um, you're still processing that. <laughs> still that, yeah, sort of inception style sleep paralysis. But um, mm -hmm. no, I'm um, yeah, I'm certainly waking up feeling a lot more refreshed now. I would recommend that if you do have a partner that is a really heavy sleeper and isn't going to wake up, that you um, you keep an eye on the the tools and techniques but also maybe having a mantra um something that calms you that you know because your inner voice starts mm. uh, waking up as well so having a thing that's that calms you that relaxes mm. you that's i'm okay i'm here yeah. i'm okay i'm here keeping, i'm okay i'm here keeping yeah. calm reminding yeah. yourself reminding that nothing yourself, bad is really going happen. to happen yeah. yeah that you are safe has been something that's really kept me going <laughs> <laughs> fantastic well I hope you continue to sleep well. Thank you very much. And yeah, thank you so much. That's been really fascinating for me. Hopefully I won't have any more experiences of weird people in the corner of my room. <laughs> thank you for watching the Sleep Matters podcast from Dreams. If you enjoyed it, then please press the like button below. And if you want to see more, then you can subscribe to the series. <laughs>